I'm Dr. Jeffrey Chadwick. Uh, welcome to Gospel Tangents. Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. In our final conversation with Dr. Jeffrey Chadwick of BYU, we'll talk about what he refers to as the myth of the lambing season. What is that exactly? We'll also ask, how cold does it get in Israel during the Christmas season? Check out our conversation. I, you know, here in Utah, obviously we got snow. In fact, there's snow on the mountains behind you there. Um, but the Mediterranean climate, it's probably not, it's not this cold. Sure, what, but it's still what, winter. Yeah. But <laughs> because was, winter is judged by the length of the day, not yeah. by the temperature. But what was the temperature like? What, or what, I guess, what is the temperature like in November, December in, in Israel? Oh, you know, um, it rarely freezes. Um, the tempers in, temperatures in Jerusalem today are probably about 15 degrees Celsius, which is going to be in the 50s to 60s. And, so cool, but uh, not bad. Yeah, I mean, it, you do snow. I mean, I've lived in Jerusalem enough to know that you can get some pretty interesting snow storms. But, but the really cold weather doesn't last more than just a few days, and it goes away, and then it's beautiful. The, the average day in Jerusalem in December and January is partly cloudy with green grass and jacket temperatures. Nothing like, you know, the winters of Utah and Idaho. Um, and that brings up another thing, and, and this, is, <laughs> this is what I call the myth of the lambing season. Oh, really? Yeah, because, you know, the idea that Jesus was born in the spring uh, was not unique to Latter-day Saints in the 1800s. Okay. Others were suggesting this as well. And Protestant writers in America, familiar with freezing North American winters, okay, because they were usually from New England or somewhere like that, uh, couldn't imagine how shepherds could be in the fields abiding by their flocks in December. Oh, just much too cold. No shepherd to be out with his flocks in December, they ruled. So it must be in the springtime, because spring is when the lambs are born. And since Jesus was the Lamb of God, that's when he would have been born, too, is in the spring. And this, of course, plays in really well with the, the tradition within among the Latter-day Saints that Jesus was born in April. The problem is it's, it's an entire falsity. Um, and the, the reason why is that shepherds did and still do go out with their flocks all winter long. I have stood in the fields outside of Bethlehem on several Christmas Eves, because I, I get to be there from time to time, mm -hmm. and the shepherds are out there with their sheep, and little lambs have been born already mm. in December. Okay? They don't wait. Now, here in our climate, just because of the way that the lambs and, and the sheep bear, they'll wait till it's a little warmer, and they'll lamb in, in March and April. But that's not the way that it works in, in uh, the Holy Land because the climate doesn't require it. And biology works partially because of its climate. The peak of the period of lambing, and this is mostly among Arab shepherds who, who, who handle more of the flocks than, say, the, the Israeli you know, uh, agriculture does. But the peak for lambing in in the Palestinian areas is early February. Um, it starts in December with lambs, and they are born at an increasing rate through December and January, and they peak in early February, and then they fall off through mid and late February and March, and the, the latest lambs are born is about the end of March. So that what happens is that the lambing season, if you take the peak of it, doesn't support either December or April because the peak of it's up here. Mm -hmm. But it starts already in December and is going in December. So there's nothing about a lambing season that only starts in early spring. Uh, that's a myth in terms of the Holy Land. So mm -hmm. there's nothing about that that points to Jesus being born in the spring or April that, that has any validity. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it, it's, it's interesting how many things that we will, we will look outside the texts of Scripture on to try to understand our Christmas season when really the very best evidence is in the texts. It's in the time spans that you see presented in the Book of Mormon. It's in the interesting, you know, um, 
correlation between the book of Matthew and, and the book of Luke in, in the two, mm-hmm. you know, Jesus birth narratives there. And when you put all that together, uh, particularly because of the, the length of life Jesus had and the only possible years that there exist for his death, uh, and um, you, you come to, to just this narrow window of time, three to four months before April 1st of 4 BC as the only window in which Jesus can have been born. And yeah, that's, that's where it is. Uh, Hmm. And what surprises people is that it falls in the Christmas season that we have celebrated for low these many years. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. So the one I didn't mean for it to, it just (laughs) wound up. I didn't, I didn't start out by saying, I'm going to prove December is Christmas season. Uh, what I want to do is find out what does all the evidence suggest when you put it together. Mm-hmm. And I was as surprised as anybody else years and years ago when it started working out this way. Wow, that's interesting. So I do have one last question. Um, so the star, I, I, I remember watching a video several years ago. Um, I think it was called The Mystery of the Three Kings. It was a Protestant group that put it together. but. Mm-hmm. One of the things that they said, they were really big on this idea that the wise men came from Iran and were probably Zoroastrian because apparently they look at the stars a lot or, or something like that. I'm not familiar. Well, with they're that. astrologers. Okay. But remember that, that, that Jews were astrologers too. The whole law of Moses is caught up with the calendar and the, and the, and the lunar cycles. So they're always looking to the skies for okay. all their dating. Okay. Well, the one thing, so there was a, a, a person on the on the video that I saw that that had identified, and I, I might have this wrong, but I believe it was where Jupiter and Saturn came together and looked like it was yeah, one star. They're looking at a confluence of planets as a right. bright light, right? Right, right. And so, and it was in Pisces. I wish I knew that. I'll have to. <laughs> yeah. Which meant the Jews. I don't remember, but anyway, so they had like all these really good reasons why. The stars aligned. I don't remember what the year was, but it was probably pretty close to to what you're saying. The 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 problem that we have with the star is actually we don't have any real good appearance of a star. We don't have any like supernova that was visible that we're aware of. We don't have any manifestation that we can really nail down as having been the star of Bethlehem. If we did, boy, that'd be much more on it than just a few History Channel, you know, speculations. Mm -hmm. Um, We can't account for it. What we can account for is that that both Matthew 2 and 3 Nephi assert that there was a star. So the Book of Mormon gives a second witness to that. Well, and that's what I was going to wonder, but it sounds like you've kind of answered that question, is... You know, these, these Pro- this Protestant group has a pretty good idea that it was Jupiter and Saturn that the, the wise men in the east saw and followed to, to Bethlehem. But in America, is there something, there's not really anything similar no, that you no. can identify? Well, as there's, really, there's really nothing. A, conflu- a, a confluence of planets would have been visible for long enough for it to be seen on this, on this you know, side of the world as well as on that. But the, the, the more important thing is that none of those really work out with the window I've suggested it. Okay. I, I think you're talking 7 BC for one of those things. Oh, it is? Okay. Yeah. Um, now, I also think that the ancient peoples, the Jews certainly could, and I know the ancient Persians could, they could tell the difference between a planet and a star. They knew where the planets were, and they knew where they were moving. At least they knew where, where Jupiter was, because it's always been visible. Uh, and I don't think they would have mistaken a confluence of planets or a planet for a star. Um, my best guess at this is that we're talking about a manifestations in the heaven that was outside of any of the norm that we're used to. Okay? Um, and that that manifestation was there as a specific sign that, that Jesus was born and that it went away. In other words... You can call it a star, but I'm not convinced it's a star in the way we think of stars, okay? Because it appeared, and then it's no longer there. Um, you could say that it was like a, uh, a, a dark star that supernovaed or something, but I think that you're, 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 you're assuming too much there. It could have been anything. 
I, I will just say that, that it appears from both scripture accounts, the New Testament and the Book of Mormon, that God caused a star-like manifestation to appear coincident to the birth of Christ, and that it was witnessed by the wise men and by the Nephites. And that's as much as I can do with it. My data tend to be more textual and historical text. And again, the number one thing is the death date of Herod the Great. The number two thing, okay, is the length of Jesus' life. The number three thing is what day can he have died, and counting back 33 years, what window of time could he have been born in. And the fourth thing is to take all those little details in Luke and Matthew about the birth, the 40 days of the purification, the arrival of the wise men, etc., and fit them into the story in whatever window works. And for my research, at least, the window of time is between three and four months before Herod's death, which means December of 5 BC. Hmm. Well, you've definitely laid out a pretty good case there. So. <laughs> well, it's actually better if you don't try to verbally state it, but you can do it with footnotes, which is why, <laughs> again, you know, I suggest BYU studies, and uh, you might even want to get the uh, the wonderful ebook Stone Manger, uh -huh. The Untold Story of the First Christmas, which you can get by going to Amazon and entering the name Jeffrey R. Chadwick. Or we have a link that is simply www.stonemanger.com. All right. And that doesn't show you my face. It just links you direct to Amazon. <laughs> uh, that, by the way, is, is a book that you can read your kids. It's, it's, it's for general audiences, and it's, it's a real fun read. And it's, I, I think we've written it to be not a scientific or a historian's read, historian's read but an inspiring read. Oh, cool. Cool. All right. Well, are there any other projects you're working on right now? That I'm always working about? on projects. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just about to begin the writing of a book that we've had uh, in mind for many years now uh, that's based on a course that I teach here at BYU called The Book of Mormon in the Land of Jerusalem. Hmm. And what it does is look at the setting of Lehi and Nephi in the Land of Jerusalem and um, uh, understanding... First Nephi, basically, but also, you know, elements of Second Nephi in the book of Jacob, because Nephi and Jacob were both natives of the Near East, so they would be likely to reflect that in their writings. But looking particularly at the narrative in First Nephi in terms of the ancient Near East, the archaeology, the geography, the history, the languages of the land of Jerusalem. It's a fascinating course. We have a lot of fun in it. Hmm. And uh, after this much time of teaching it, I, I began teaching it 25 years ago at the Jerusalem Center in 1993. This is 2018. It seems it's time to actually write the thing down. So we're, <laughs> we're working on that book right now. Plus, I'm working on a lot of archaeological reports that don't make their way into the Latter-day Saint aud audience, but kind of go into, you know, the, the tomes of academia from our excavations at several sites uh, uh, Hebron, Gath, and others. Oh, wow. Now, I previously interviewed a guy by the name of George Potter. Do you know George? I, I do not. George and I are not personally, you okay. know, uh, affiliated. I know of him. I know of, uh, of his work. I've actually reviewed his work that he's done in terms of Arabia. Yeah. Uh, 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 another person that works there uh, uh, quite a lot, Warren Aston, is a good friend of mine. Oh, yeah. And Kent Brown. I need to talk who, to Warren. Oh, you should. <laughs> Warren is fascinating. He's got that great accent, too. Um, uh, but also uh, my, my uh, colleague, S. Kent Brown, okay. also uh, has done work on the Arabian part of, of the Lehi story. And all of them, I think, uh, have, have made some wonderful contributions. Okay, so there, so you're pretty much in agreement with the well, I, I, trail in Arabia. I, I I I I think that the the trail that we generally project going south southeast through the Hejaz Mountains and then turning somewhere probably in North Yemen eastward and, and going into Oman has got to be has got to be the route. Okay, mm -hmm. the question is where was the Valley of Lemuel? Right. I don't think it's a Taibalism as George Potter proposes. I think that that site has several things wrong with it and. This has been published, by the way, in another journal that we have here at mm -hmm. BYU called the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. Um, 
Uh, and um, he suggests a place slightly east of Salala, Kor Rory, as Bountiful, right. whereas Warren Aston's suggestion of Kor Karfot, I think, actually works better in the story. Um, but, but Potter and Wellington, uh, Richard Wellington is his co-author on their book, uh, do a wonderful job talking about a lot of the dynamics in that, in that desert uh, trek, and I, and I really think it's, it's worth it, even though I disagree about the Taibalism spot. Uh, and what Warren Aston has done is spectacular. Uh, Journey of Faith by Kent Brown and his associates uh, mm -hmm. is really, it, it's all just great reading. Um, the thing about it is, is that not only in terms of this, the story of the birth of Christ or the story of Nephi, is, is no one person has this all nailed down. Right. Uh, not me on this subject, not them on, on that. So you have to read across, you know, the spectrum to kind of get, everything that people are saying and then it it comes down to you know uh, to you the reader to you the student to decide after reading what all the approaches of these people are where do i see the best line running and and that's why it's it's nice to read widely hmm. oh, cool well i appreciate you spending so much time here on gospel tangents and, well uh, a, a good luck editing this uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do it with them all. So. Yeah. All right. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll uh, just uh, wish all of your viewers, uh, all, of your, uh, all of your flock, uh, a very Merry Christmas season. All right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. All the best. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Jeff Chadwick. Thanks, Jeff. I really appreciate it. I'd also like to encourage you to go out and buy his book on Amazon called The Stone Manger. I've got a link here on YouTube for those of you, but just do a search for either Jeff Chadwick or The Stone Manger in Amazon. Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. In our next conversation, we're going to jump back to Dr. Thomas Wayman, and we're going to talk about Bible errors. Tom makes a pretty strong statement. We're, we are absolutely confident that 1 John 5-7 is a forgery. Now, when you say we... Scholars. Scholars are... If you'd like a transcript of this conversation, we'll have it out shortly. I'd also like to thank you for those of you who are subscribing on Patreon.com. Please tell your friends. It's really helpful and will help support future documentaries and podcasts such as this. Also, make sure that you subscribe on our Facebook page at Facebook.com slash Gospel Tangents. You can get our Twitter updates at Gospel Tangents. Also, make sure that you, if you'd like a written copy, go to our Amazon page. You can search for that. I've got a link here, but just do a search for Gospel Tangents Interview, and you should be able to find it there. You can also purchase a transcript of this at gospeltangents.com shop. All of those proceeds will go to me and not to Amazon, so I really encourage you to do that. Make sure that you subscribe on our Apple Podcast page. Um, I've got a link here, but you can just do a search for uh, Gospel Tangents there. If you'd like to get a transcript, click here. To subscribe to here on YouTube, go ahead and click here. And over here, you'll see some of our other videos. Thanks for listening, and we appreciate you listening to Gospel Tangents.